Well, today we are going to look at the topic, accept the gifts that God has given you. God has given us lots of gifts, and sometimes because uh, of fear, we don't take those gifts, we don't advance with them. So the uh, bi biblical metaphor for that is uh, when Israel was going into the promised land, the entire first generation refused to go in because they were afraid. And many people are like that when they receive gifts from God, they think that's too much, I'm not powerful enough, that I, I couldn't do that. And so what, because of a lack of faith, they don't accept what God has given them. Uh, but this is our topic today, accept the gifts God has given you. An alternative title is you can't steal what you've been freely given. There are some people who try to steal what God has already given them. That's not possible. When God has given you a gift, you can't do anything except receive it. Or, well, you could reject it, but you certainly can't steal it. It's already yours. So we're going to look at that in a number of uh, verses in the Bible, but I'm going to start with something you probably can't see, so I'm going to just have to describe it to you. There is uh, a art show that's in Michigan once a year, uh, founded by a grandson of, of the Amway fortune. and. Um, the grandson decided uh, we really should have an art festival where anyone can enter and uh, the public votes on what's best. And so uh, it's called Art Prize. It's been running for about five years. A new edition of it is going to start in Dallas next year. And, uh, and a few years ago, one of the artists who entered was Jeremy Tubbs. The uh, painting that Jeremy created was about um, roughly six to eight feet wide, maybe four feet high, something in that rough dimension. So large scale work, and uh, and it's a, he had a number of pieces over a number of years about subways in black and white. So you look at this, and whatever you can see on that, uh, that's a subway in black and white, and. I uh, have been to art show every year but the first year, and it, it, it's over uh, a section of about a mile or two. It doesn't sound like that much, but unless you walk as fast as you can for three days from noon to 10 o'clock, you'll never see everything. So when I go through, I'm looking, admiring, enjoying, but I don't pause at every artwork because you'd never see, you wouldn't see a tenth of it that way. So I'm looking at stuff fairly quickly and every now and then something will catch my attention and I'll stop and ask about it. But for the most part, even things that I like, I'm just saying, wow, that's cool. And that was my reaction with it. it this is a really great piece, really nice. And I moved on. There was a guy, this, uh, the first year that I saw one, it was in the Women's Center, and so when I say there was a guy, it was kind of unusual, because, uh, um, but there was a tall guy there, uh, and I don't know if he was a spectator or a docent, but as I turned and walked away from this piece, he said, you know, that's made out of duct tape. I turned around and looked again. I thought it was a really fine piece of art when I thought it was paint. When I realized it was duct tape, I thought, well, I need to look at that some more. Uh, that, how did you do that? How did he do that? Uh, so there are times when we think we've seen something, but we haven't seen it at all. We've seen surface details about it, but we haven't figured out the, some of the underlying stuff about it, and we maybe haven't even figured out what makes it interesting. So there are times when we think we've seen something, but it hasn't had an impact, and unless there's someone standing next to us who helps us see, you know, you really could take a better look at that and notice what you miss. Sometimes we'll walk away without seeing anything of significance. Uh, we're going to look at a number of verses in the uh, three verses in the 
uh, sections in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, that are quoted by Jesus and other writers in the New Testament. We're going to start in Psalm 118, which we've been looking at on and off in this season because this psalm is referenced by Jesus as he enters into Jerusalem, and there's a lot about it that's messianic and talking about uh, the, the Messiah, Jesus. And uh, today we're going to look at just a couple verses in it, starting in verse 21. I thank you that you have answered me. This is to God. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So when builders are looking to create a stone building, they want the base to be stable and, and hopefully the bottom stone is going to be one that they can build on. So they, as they build up, the bottom stone doesn't cause the entire building to wobble because of how the stone is at the bottom. When the builders were looking, the psalmist says, at this stone, they said, that's not good enough for anything. We're not even going to use it for the top of our building. The builders rejected the stone completely, but God turned it into the most important stone of the building, the stone on which everything else is based and founded and without which you couldn't do the building. The stone that some people looked at and said, yeah, nice, but I'm going to keep looking. Or worse than that, yeah. Isaiah says people look at Jesus and they say, eh. Nothing about him to capture our attention. The stone that people thought, not much there, God looked at and said, this is the foundation of everything. This is what I'm going to build on. This is what's going to, everything's going to have to align itself to. This is the most important. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Uh, we're going to look at three verses I said. We're going to look at another one in Isaiah, two in Isaiah. This is the first one. Isaiah 8, verse 11. The Lord has warned me not to walk in the way of this people. So God warned Isaiah, don't be like the people you're surrounded with. That's very difficult. Typically, we, we pick up the attributes of the people we're around. So if you want to lose weight, the easiest way to do it is to find fitter friends. Because they will encourage you to do activities. They'll say, really? Are you really going to eat that when you're... It, if you want to do something, the easiest way to do it is to get around friends who are doing that. And they will encourage you to step up your game and to be doing the things that you want to do. Isaiah is surrounded by people that are trying to influence him to be a particular way, and God says, don't be like them. Everything in your system will be crying out to try and pattern yourself around the people after you, like you, uh, people surrounding you, but don't do that. You have to be with them, but not like them. Don't walk in the way of these people. Don't call conspiracy all that they call conspiracies. I've got some friends who listen to late night radio who probably need to study this verse a little bit, but we'll move on from there. Uh, don't fear what they fear or to be in dread. You know, there's probably some network television that this applies to, too, but I guess I should really leave that alone. Don't fear what people around you fear or be in dread. This is something that applied not just to Isaiah but to us as well, but it's far easier to read than it is to accomplish. This business of not fearing, uh, Jesus says, I'm giving you my peace. Don't let your heart be troubled. So you can have Jesus' peace and a troubled heart. Don't do that, Jesus says. Focus on the peace that God gives you. Don't fear, God tells Isaiah, don't fear what other people fear. And uh, that's difficult, but it's what we're called to do. The Lord of hosts, God tells Isaiah, 
the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. If you want to focus on something that is powerful, something that you should be in awe of, it should be God. Not the economy of the nation or some other thing that is currently terrifying to you. Don't be afraid of what other people are afraid of. God will become a sanctuary, a stone one strikes against. For both houses of Israel, he will become a rock that one stumbles over. So in the original context of this uh, verse to Isaiah, God is going to become a stumbling stone for people who should have been worshiping God. But instead, they started to look around at the landscape and to become afraid of what they saw instead of praising God, who's clearly above the landscape. But it's very easy when there's a giant in front of us to focus on the giant instead of saying, could you move just a little bit so I can focus on God? Because I see how big you are, but you're blocking my way of seeing how big God is. Okay. One last verse from the Hebrew Scriptures before we see where it's quoted in the New Testament. This is Isaiah 28, starting in verse 14. Uh, Isaiah is announcing to people, the people of Israel, the word of God for them. Because you have said, we've made a covenant with death. So the leaders of the land were afraid of death. They were afraid of a plague, and they decided, rather than trust God, focus on God, cry out to God, they decided to focus on the plague, on the trouble and death. And they made a covenant with it. They made a bargain with it. If, we, if you don't harm us, we'll do this. So now Isaiah is proclaiming God's word to those people, the rulers who have done that. Because you've said we made a covenant with death, the over, when the overwhelming scourge passes, through, it won't come to us. We bargained with it already. It's agreed to let us alone. But you shouldn't be bargaining with your troubles. You shouldn't be negotiating with your fears. You should be talking to God who loves you and is worthy of your praise and can do something about your fears. Uh, because you made a bargain with death and because you uh, because of this covenant thought that the scourge isn't going to harm you when it comes through. Because you've said we made lies our refuge and we're going to, in falsehood, we've taken our shelter. So God looks on their, what they think is a good covenant and says, you made a covenant with lies and falsehood. That's not going to get you anywhere. Because of that, God says, I'm laying in Zion a foundation stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone. I'm going to put down something that will be the bedrock foundation around which everyone is forced to build. This is something that's going to establish, you're trying to lay a foundation with fear, a covenant with fear and things that you're afraid of. I'm putting down something that you're going to have to build around. The standard, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, one who trusts will not panic. We're going to come back to this verse in just a second. And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plummet. So I, the, this cornerstone is going to help establish justice and righteousness. When you look at the, this cornerstone, you're going to see where righteousness is. You're going to see where justice is. You might think, oh, I've been wounded. I should, get, I should get recompense. Well, look at the cornerstone and see that's where you determine justice. Not your own idea about ego-driven, self-centered thinking. You get your idea of where justice is from looking at the cornerstone. I will make justice the line and righteousness the plummet. Now, uh, I said we'd come back to a verse. So in the Bibles that we have in the pews, the New Revised Standard Version, this is how it's, quote, this is how it's translated. The sure foundation is this quote, one who trusts will not panic. 
So the way the translators of this version read the passage is that the foundation that you can establish justice with and righteousness with is having faith, trusting God and not panicking, not making bargains with death or with things that you're afraid of, but trusting God, not panicking. That's not the only way to translate this particular verse, and that's in terms of all the translations that are out there in English. This is a minority view. So the NIV has a different translation on this particular verse. The New International Version says, there's a sure foundation, and the one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. So in the NIV and most of the other translations that I've seen that uh, the verse is that the foundation that's established will cause you to not be afraid when you rely on it. Regardless of how you decide this verse should be translated, by the time this verse is picked up in the New Testament, the foundation is Jesus. The cornerstone is Jesus. The, the way that you measure your life to establish justice and righteousness, Jesus. So we're going to look at a couple of verses where this gets picked up. First one is in 1 Peter 2. So 1 Peter is writing to a, a congregation, could be people like us, giving people like us advice. Come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals. So come to Jesus even though other people in the culture say, yeah, there's nothing that important about him. We follow Jesus' sign, we're going to whack that because we don't want people to follow Jesus. Come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. There are times when what God does looks so lowly, so unimportant, so mediocre, so backwoods. Jesus could have been born in the palace. He wasn't even born in the city, the main city. He was born out where the cows were in a feeding trough. My sister circulated on Facebook a couple days ago a picture of the hospital which she was born in, which was um, in the, in the United States, it's one of the least desirable places you could have been born in. Uh, probably it would be a fine hospital in some third world countries, but uh, at least for the United States, um, she was one of the last babies born there because it was sort of a wreck. Um, Jesus wasn't born in a hospital that nice. As much of a dump as it was. Jesus was born in a, in a barn. And there are examples of that throughout Scripture, but especially throughout today. There are times when in your life you think, this does not look that great. And it is God being born in a profound way, doing a profound work, just one that's disguised from the world, one that doesn't look like that much. One that others would say, hmm, yeah, nice, and keep walking on without realizing the significance of it because they didn't take a better look. Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. To do that, you'll have to get close to Jesus. You'll have to align yourself with Jesus. You'll have to let him be the way that you determine what's righteous and just. Not your feelings, not the culture, not your friends. Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture, it stands in Scripture, See, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So Peter, as he's writing, quotes Isaiah. This passage that we looked at, Isaiah 28. And then he continues, To you then who believe, Jesus is precious. But for those who don't believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corners. He quotes 
Psalm 118. So there are people who will look at Jesus and say, yeah, he's, no he's nothing. At best, he was a prophet, but he's nothing for me, some people say. And they miss that this stone that, every, that many people reject is what God says is the most important. So some people say, oh yeah, I follow Jesus. I watched the movie about him, well, 10 years ago, and that's their main contact with Jesus. People who follow Jesus regularly renew their relationship by reminding themselves what he's like in what he might do in every situation of their lives. A stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. <clears throat> so he quotes Isaiah 8. So each of those three verses get picked up by First Peter, or by Peter. We're gonna um, close, well, we've got one more verse to go. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that. So the reason that you have so much glory in God's sight. Other people may look at you and say, yeah, that's not much. But God is pouring glory on you so that you might proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So other people might look at the baby born in the manger or the man dying on the cross or the way that you're serving Jesus and say, yeah, that's not very spectacular. What I really like is things that are magnificent and mighty and powerful and well-constructed and put together and really awe-inspiring. So I'm not gonna pay attention to the manger or the cross or what's going on in your life. What I'm gonna focus on is this glorious work over here. Jesus is the foundation, God says the one on whom you should build your life. There are many magnificent things that have God's inspiration in them, but God is commonly in the manger and the cross and the parts of your life that don't feel like they're working out. We're going to take a moment for prayer. God, we're probably all over the map if you looked at our lives in total. Sometimes when we're building right on that great foundation that Jesus laid. And sometimes uh, we're probably way off the foundation, building on sand instead of the rock. So we ask that you help us to be able to recognize the work that you're doing and to conform our lives to yours and to do the great things that you call us to do without needing it to look any more than a manger or a cross. We're so grateful when it does look like more than that, when people can see, wow, 5,000 people fed, that was amazing. But we're thankful that you are in our lives, in the broken parts, when nobody's interested, when the world looks at it and says, there's nothing there, that you look at us and say, you are my beloved child, and in your life today, I will make my way known and my love known and my mercy and compassion known. We thank you and we praise you. Amen.